Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Bissell. I'm Liz Vanishell. This week we have Robin Kincaid on the show. Here's the deal. If you get through this, it's kind of like tempering you. Because when you become in the business, you're going to run into things that you weren't expecting. And it's not about you. It's about the shoot. And if you can understand that at a really deep level, you will do well in this business. Robin is a producer who is currently offering a course on how to succeed and, and rise up as a production assistant. She talks about her unorthodox career and her passion for supporting people on sets to make it as efficient as possible and to help others climb the ladder of production. But I also want to add on a personal note, so I worked with Robin as a PA like 10 years ago on um, The Amazing Race. And it was like, I was one of a hundred PAs that were hired for this job. And she fucking remembered me. Yes, because um, you're Ulrich. You're like tall <laughs> and memorable. <laughs> but I, I don't know. It was like, I was just like a nervous little timid PA, just like trying to do the, the best job I can. Like I got posted on like, you know, whatever by Coit Tower. And my job was to like, like radio when the uh, competitors were like running up the hill or whatever. It's like. I don't know, man. It was it was so funny. Um, but anyways, so yeah, Robin was a joy to have on the show. She's also part of the Bay Area film uh, production community, and she's you know got a lot of the people who've been on this show um, as a part of her um, course, like Hilton Day, um, my AD on my feature, and also guest of the show. Um, he's like included in this uh, program, so yeah, it's just a really cool thing. And she had so many great stories about just how to how to get on set and how to make it, you know, uh, in this crazy industry. So, yeah. But before we get to that. Let's talk about what's going on in the world. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. So I found this article uh, shared by Lex McNaughton, who was one of our players of the week a few weeks ago. And it was about the creation of a film, a feature film the past three months. It's called Six Feet Apart. So they made a film, a rom-com remotely, where the actors obviously are staying, sheltering in place, uh, but were shipped cameras to their residence. And they shot over Zooms and, you know, hangouts and all these remote uh, video conferencing services and then had one in-person sequence done under SAG guidelines at the very end of the film. Uh, The film is uh, in post currently and it is written directed by Jessa Zerobika. Um, It just reminded me, I think all of us are feeling a little bit like creatively stifled and it reminded me that actually this is not new. Um, There's this fantastic film that I supported at my job called The Cave, which is... um, about a Syrian subterranean hospital and the director wasn't on set. He just gave, it's a documentary and he just gave notes to a cinematographer, uh, multiple cinematographers and just said, shoot this, shoot this, shoot it like this. Here are my notes. And then just like got together with them before and after remotely on how they did. So it was this like, spin and this was you know it wasn't during a pandemic but it was during the syrian civil war which is still going on but i'm just saying like art finds a way uh (laughs) and i really liked hearing about this story of like she just was bored and she just wanted to be creative but um i know Ulrich, that you're still producing content throughout the pandemic and also editing so maybe we could talk about how we've all just kind of continued continued to produce Yeah. Well, so I've been a part of a couple of projects. Well, obviously I'm editing my feature, which has been amazing, but um, like I got roped into this um, collective called the other hand media, I guess is their name. And um, they are a group of artists in the Bay area. And they were like basically planning this, um, this episode, the show of a bunch of shorts they were going to make. And then the, the pandemic happened and they were like, we're going to do it anyways. And so I edited one of the short films um, and it was shot in Los Angeles. Um, Like a couple who are at both actors um, played the two leads and then they shot it all themselves, did all the order audio recording themselves while sheltering and quarantining in place. And it was about sheltering in place. 
And uh, it turned out really well. I was really proud of it and super excited to be a part of it, you know, just to have put it all together and everything. And then, yeah, I've done now two jobs as a producer. Well, one, I was like a shooter and a, you know, just like kind of a corporate video thing. And then this last one, I just got back from Los Angeles. We did a photo shoot with a 12 person crew. And so the shit's happening. I mean, it was interesting to hear from the other crew and the actors and like what their lives are like right now, because like a couple of the people that were on the set had been on sets with 40 people, um, you know, since the pandemic. And they just have like very strict guidelines they follow where there's like hand washing stations everywhere. There's like a medic who goes around and temperature checks people and like make sure that they're hand sanitizing. Everyone's got masks and they're everyone's social distancing. I heard from another uh, professional um, in LA that like they were in this, this huge, it was like a, either some sort of commercial or something. And they had like, it was like a huge crew, probably like a more like a hundred person crew and everybody had different rooms they would go into for crafty. So there was like all color coded. You'd have like your color, like camera department was like blue. There was like a green room, a purple room. And like everybody like just gets brought in together. They work together and then they eat together. And then that's just kind of how they ran it. But they, but they still also have the hand washing stations and temperature checking, all that stuff. And then there's all these waivers you have to sign. Like, you know, when you, when you arrive to like, you know, say that you are healthy for our, for our set, we did a little differently. We just like did temperature checks, social distancing masks. We actually switched masks at lunch. Cause like the CDC says you can only have a mask on for like four to six hours of it being actually working well. And then you have to switch masks. So we made people switch masks halfway through and, um, and yeah, it went really well, you know? Um, I don't know. It's just a, just like a different way of working, but like one, one of the, like the gaffer was just saying, it's like, you know, it changes things, but we still are basically doing the same thing that we did before. It's just with these like extra little things that you have to do on top of it. So it was kind of encouraging to hear, but then I, you know, talked to my gaffer friend or, or dimmer board operator friend who works on television shows. And he's like, yeah, I haven't worked on anything since. So I think this was more like commercials and, you know, like smaller projects, but not like huge TV shows or anything. The line producer for Speed of Life is actually producing Lady Parts. Um, he did a commercial, I think about two weeks ago now. And he said that um, at the beginning of each day, I am hope I'm getting this right. Um, people had to sign some sort of affidavit that said they weren't sick, just like you were talking about Auric, but that they got paid anyway, so that they're not Uh, incentivized to lie in that scenario. And so essentially the money's been set aside. And then um, another friend of mine who works in production said that you essentially have to have um, an understudy for your job in another project project that he's doing, uh, who's already trained to replace you for you when you eventually (laughs) it's like a foregone conclusion that you're going to get sick so it's like you have your backup plan already ready oh interesting um so yeah it seems like we're moving forward i these poor actors who have to be like makeup artists and cinematographers and actors and produce like oh my god it's a lot it's a lot it, it, it is a lot and like I've heard like a lot of people having to get um, tested before they get on a job. So like if they get hired, they'll get sent to a testing area and then they'll just have a test done. Um, and so it sounds like that's just kind of the new norm, you know, and uh, I don't know, I guess we'll see in two weeks if any of our crew is like, you know, hospitalized. But I also just think it's all like your comfort level. It's like, what are you comfortable taking on as a, as a person to like, like take the the exposure risk, you know, and uh I think it's, it's just, you can kind of do a lot of things now. I mean, obviously you can't do like big crowd scenes. You can't do like huge amount of extras all not wearing masks or whatever. Like you have to have people spread out more, but like, you know, pretty much my movie, like we could do 90% of it, you know, I think without, you know, breaking any guidelines, but I don't know. It just, it's gonna be interesting to see what it looks like, you know, at the end of the year, like how many movies have been made between now and, you know, December, 2020, like, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I don't want to get off on a complete tangent here, but Justin Chang wrote this great article about all the movies. Like if we were to have the Oscars right now, all the movies that could be in contention and how there are like a lot of actually fabulous contenders, like um, Eliza Hittman's film. It's like always, rarely, sometimes never. I always get the order off or like First Cow, Kelly Reichardt's film, like all of these movies that maybe are going to get a little bit more of attention um, now. Interesting. 
because of the timing of their production. Yeah, we'll see. But Ulrich, you've got mail. My breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You've got mail. So this uh, this week we have an email from a longtime listener, um, Wellington Chin C, who used to email with Timothy a bunch, apparently, and like never reached out to me, but always just kind of talked to Timothy. And Timothy was like his contact to the show or whatever. Um, and he is like a long, long time listener. And I guess the reason why they had this connection was because Timothy was making his short film Spirit Machine, which took him like five or six years to make, very visual effects heavy. And then um, Wellington has the same situation. He has a short film called Make a Mecha Blade, which he'd been working on, I think for 10 years now, also super visual effects heavy. And he just is getting ready to release it um, either later this year or oh, early next year. That's awesome. And he sent me the trailer. And oh my God, this thing is amazing. It's like a Kung Fu action movie, you know, just super, super awesome uh, special effects and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was really awesome to hear from Wellington. He didn't really ask a question. We just like kind of had a nice, um, you know, uh, interchange. Um, but then he went ahead and did us a really nice thing. He wrote us an iTunes review. Did I am now putting re- the pieces together. I was like, Wellington Chinsey, that sounds like our latest iTunes review. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I thought it was a stranger. I always am like hoping that just like these strangers will pop up, but there's always like a connection. Wellington was a stranger at one point. But, That's right. You know, because he, he didn't yeah. know Timothy before the podcast. He only found the podcast and then found Timothy as a friend. So title, my favorite filmmaking podcast by Wellington, Chin- well, it's not Wellington, Chin- it just says W. Chin C. June 27th, 2020, um, five-star review. I was never a podcast consumer until Timothy reached out to me about MMIH with Ulrich years ago. Oh, so Timothy reached out to him. Interesting. Since then, the only podcasts I listen to are about filmmaking. I'm a filmmaker that never went to film school, but found that by listening to podcasts like Making Movies is Hard and others, you can get practical advice and knowledge that film school can never give you. MMIH is one of my favorites, if not my number one filmmaking podcast, because it feels like sitting with great friends after a long day on set and commiserating about our insecurities as artists, but then at the end, feeling better about ourselves. Timothy and Ulrich are such kind people, and I was bummed when Timothy decided to leave the team. The podcast was a little scattered after that as Ulrich tried to find another co-host, but now that Liz is on board, order has been restored. Um, the order restorer. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a little scattered. Thanks so much, uh, Wellington, for um, you know the wonderful review. And that clears things up. So he didn't find the podcast organically. He was never a stranger, Ulrich. That's no, what it cleared Timothy up. Timothy <laughs> invited him. So yeah, they were, they were friends before. But, the, but that's just as good. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful review. If you want to be like W. Chinsey or Wellington Chinsey, you can send us a question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. Or if you really, really like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the places you can leave reviews for podcasts. Do you want to tell them what else we have, Liz? Yeah, we got a Patreon page. So if you really, really, really love the show, you want to support us, go over to patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. Um, Toss us whatever you feel comfortable with, and uh, maybe you'll be getting one of our brand new enamel pins or or whatever it is that you pledge to receive. Um, We just appreciate you listening. Thank you. So you make movies, huh? I produce feature motion pictures. I got an idea for a movie. This week, we have another awesome short film. We've been getting tons of short film submissions since we announced the Skit Shorty segment. And uh, this one is from Brittany Noel. This is a short that she wrote, produced, and starred in called The Other. And uh, it was directed by Shelby Roy. But let's just, before we talk about it, let's just hear from Brittany on why she made the film. So I decided to do a short versus any other medium because I wanted it to act as a calling card. Um, as someone who identifies mainly as an actress, this was my first venture into writing. And so I wanted to optimize my chances of success. Um, and I also thought the short format is a great way to sort of experiment. Um, and as a multiracial actress specifically, I found throughout the years that I wasn't quite fitting into any one box in the industry. It was kind of like I was being told either to try to be more ethnic, you know, get a fro wig, get you looking more ethnic to fit the ethnic roles or get you looking less ethnic, get some hair extensions, make you look whiter. Um, 
and none of that was really working for me. So I thought this is a great way to experiment with what if I do a little sampler of just me being authentically me with a authentic and personal story and see how that goes. Um, and also as, as far as being a creator of it, the layout of the short is set up in a way that's very much the beginning of a journey. So I thought that doing a short that way can leave open the possibility of developing it further down the road into a feature or a series of sorts, depending on how I do and how it's received. I came up with the majority of the funds through crowdfunding on Kickstarter. Um, our campaign was featured as one of Kickstarter's projects we love, which was awesome. And it was super rewarding to see people of all backgrounds, really anyone who felt like an outsider or just struggled for acceptance in what's our very label-driven society, uh, just rally behind the film, the other. So before making the short, I hoped that it would open doors for me um, career-wise and in a bigger picture way, start changing the narrative around mixed race representation in entertainment. Um, what did end up happening was it got accepted into some really wonderful film festivals and started some really interesting dialogue with both audiences and, uh, and other filmmakers, um, but kind of still seeing where the change will lie as far as the bigger picture goes. Now that it's out in the world, um, the film's bigger purpose, I think, is to shine a light on the really far-reaching and sort of ripple effects of racism in our society and to spark conversation and understanding around it. Um, you know, now really feels like the time to be having this kind of dialogue and begin change in our society with how we treat each other, um, as well as begin change in the industry around how we as people of diverse ethnic backgrounds are represented in entertainment. I actually supported Brittany Newell's crowdfunding campaign years ago when I worked at Sundance and gave them some tips on how to raise funds. And um, so I've been following and tracking this project for a while. I really liked the pace of this film. You know, I know that it's a topic that gets talked about quite a lot, race and perspective and identity. But I thought uh, what was really elegant about this film is that there's so much unsaid. And that's those unsaid pieces were like the meat of the film. Like she never talked about her own self bias. Uh, and I like that she let the audience kind of chew on that themselves. And, um, you know, obviously, it's a very personal piece. She wrote, she produced, she starred in it. She had family members star in it. So um, I always really um, am attracted to that kind of content. I agree. I love the pace. I thought the pace was great. I normally hate flashbacks. Like I'm just like a anti flashback person, like unless it's done really well. And I thought that uh, the way they did the flashbacks in this film was really elegant and seamless. It let the story unfold in a way that that felt natural, you know, where, where, with not a lot of exposition dialogue. They just let these moments of of her past play out, intercut with this this moment that she's you know preparing for and that she, you know, eventually that's like the last scene of the film, basically this this conversation this confession almost in a way. But yeah, I thought it was really powerful. I mean, it's something that like you know, obviously I can't really relate to, um, you know, just being a white person, but it's something that you definitely see a lot in, in the world, like this kind of racism and just the way that people talk about people in a very insensitive way, you know, especially as a younger kid where you have no idea what you're saying. It like let me into someone's world, you know, that like I didn't know, but it felt like, it almost felt like having this kind of uncomfortable conversation with a friend by watching this film, you know, in a way, which to have like something that personal come through a short is, is I think really, it's, it doesn't happen that often. Like usually shorts are more like, oh, here's a little slice or whatever, or like a little piece. But this was like, felt like a very complete like thought in a way. Yeah, I like that you said confession. Um, I think that's really appropriate. And there's this one moment at the end uh, after a flashback where we cut back to Brittany's, um, Brittany's protagonist character, her eyes are like welled with tears, but the last time you saw her, they weren't. And it was like this really nice touch where it's like, you never have, I don't know, what would you call it? Like a temporal ellipses within a flashback where you're not seeing the character go through the emotion. But in this one, you just get to see, you don't see her go through the realization. You see the after effects of it, which is I've never seen that before. I thought that was really cool. 
Well, well done, Shilpi and, and Brittany. Um, yeah, and please, if you have a short and you would like amplification, send it to us at podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. Yeah, absolutely. I, you got it perfect. I don't know. I just, I love this. I love this. This is a way to like just showcase more films. And I, will, I really want to hear from listeners. Like, what was your reaction to this short? Like if, if you watch one of the shorts that are on the show and like it spoke to you, I would love to, to know like what your reaction was. Or like, do you agree with us? Do you disagree with us? Let us know. What about truth? What about the reality? What about the way the old ending tested in Canoga Park? So we have our, our segment called The Player, where we interview women in the industry on um, various topics. And I've been pushing this topic for two weeks now. And I actually wanted to talk about to you, Ulrich, about how we've gotten so few bites. No one wants to submit a soundbite. We call it a soundbite. No one wants to submit a soundbite on this topic. And I think it could be the way I worded the question. It could be the fact that, you know, the 4th of July was recently, or, you know, maybe people are lazy. But the subject was, you know, talk about a time you felt you had imposter syndrome and how did you get over it? How did you battle it? And I had a lot of women tell me that they had imposter syndrome about submitting a sound bite to talk about imposter syndrome. And it was like this crazy, <laughs> like, wow. I can't even fully work that out in my mind. Um, but yeah, no one wanted to talk about their experience with imposter syndrome, except for Diane Bell, who's <laughs> the only sound bite we got this week. And she's luckily quite eloquent. So thank you, Diane. Hi, I'm Diane Bell, screenwriter and director. So when I decided to make my first film, I first created a concept trailer in order to raise money to finance the movie. And when I was shooting this concept trailer, this was literally the first time I had directed anything. I had not been to film school. I had never directed a short film. I had never directed a music video. And in all honesty, I had never been part of a crew. So really, I'd never been on a film set. And there I was directing my concept trailer. And on the first morning, I have to say, we were out in Death Valley and everybody's looking to me. What are we doing? Yeah. And I just, I just panicked. I had one moment where I thought, what am I doing? Who am I? This is not me. I have no right to be doing this. And I just took myself aside. Everybody else was having lunch. They were in some greasy diner in the middle of the desert. And I went and sat by myself with my journal and I breathed and I said, Diane, stop pretending you don't know what you're doing. You know the movie you are making. Breathe, own it, claim it, step up. And that's always been my strategy since then. I have felt imposter syndrome many times since then. For instance, when I was making the film, when it got into Sundance, all the things. But I always just sell myself, you know what you're doing. Fake it till you make it, <laughs> right? Fake it till you make it, and it works. All right, what do you think is going on here? Like, why don't people want to talk about having imposter syndrome? It's probably because they don't want it to be true you know, or like if they talk about their feelings of being an imposter, maybe that actually makes them imp an imposter or it outs them as not being as confident or as skilled as they think, as, as the world thinks they are. You it's know too saying? vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, like, especially as a director, like, you know, they talk a lot about like, you know, having confidence and knowing what you want and having, believing in your vision and everything. And so especially, as a director, like to admit that you have an imposter syndrome feeling like, oh, I, I don't even like know what I'm doing, like, or what I'm doing here. I think like it takes away from your allure maybe to people. I don't know. I mean, I mean that's just me guessing, I guess. But, uh, you know, I think people are really like into like that image of, yes, I am an artist and I, this is my art and I know exactly how to get my art done. And you know, I don't want to show any um, flaws in my armor of my persona, whatever that is, you know? I hate that. I really like, I know sometimes I take it to the, like, a natural extension of, of that characteristic, and I, I shouldn't, but I like when people admit doubt or they're unsure, but maybe an actor doesn't want to hear a director say, I don't know, but, <laughs> um, but I do think we shouldn't be so afraid of vulnerability. The, like, two to three emails that I received or Facebook messages I received from women who did not want to submit said that they either were shy or didn't think that anyone would want to hear 
them talk about their imposter syndrome. Have you had imposter syndrome, Auric? I have a, a number of times um, throughout my career in different different situations, like, you know, even from being a PA to directing to, to whatever. But I had a story I wanted to share about um, working with some big celebrities. And, and it wasn't the first time I had worked with big celebrities. Like I had worked with some really fa famous, fancy people before. But um, basically, this was like probably 2014 or something like back when Game of Thrones was like the hottest of the hotness. Like I think season four was uh, just about to come out. Um, and I got hired to do uh, two interviews with two of the stars of the show, Amelia Clark and Nikolai Costa Waldu. And I was hired as the cinematographer. So it was like my job to come in and light the interview and, um, you know, like make sure it's like HBO high quality ready whatever you know and so I was like walking to that like okay I know I can handle this I've lit a hundred interviews before like I've, I'm confident like I got partnered with some, somebody who was quite senior to me who I'd worked with as a PA before so like I was the cinematographer and this guy was a second shooter who's like you know like yeah I was like his assistant like years ago and so it was sort of like oh, okay well let, let me make sure I'm going to do a good enough job of course he couldn't have been nicer and like we collaborated really well on it. And, um, you know, so we do the, the setup, we get all ready, like, you know, we do it as a team. And then the producers from New York come in and they're all like extremely nervous about the actors. And, you know, it's like setting this like sort of stage of like, oh my gosh, like let's not offend these people. Like we have to make sure this goes smoothly, like blah, 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 all this stuff. And then Amelia Clark walks in and she's like, couldn't be sweeter, just the nicest person. And then she has a team of like five, makeup and hair people like get in her like shirt right and like makeup and everything and then we roll the camera on the interview and uh her hair keeps on falling in her face like over and over and over again and this squadron of people who have their own monitor just to watch her makeup are not saying anything like no one's saying anything like they don't like it's like they don't want to like offend her or or whatever like who knows and so like i had to tell her to like brush her hair off like you know three or four times throughout the interview and it was like you know, I was very polite and she was super nice and it was great. And then, and then Nikolai comes in after that and then we do Nikolai's interview and they have all these questions they want to ask him, but like, they just wouldn't ask him the questions. And it was like, what? <laughs> like, and he was like, also couldn't have been a nicer person, which is like super cool. And at the end of the interview, he was like, do you need anything else? And he's, the producer was like, no, 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 that's okay. And then like, he turns to me, he's like, are you sure you guys need anything else? And I was like, I guess if he says we don't, we don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it was just so weird. And that's like, I started in that, that situation feeling like I didn't belong there and that I wasn't worthy of doing this. And by the end of it, I was like, oh, it's really not that big of a deal. It's like, it's the same as lighting any executive or anyone else. It's just, they're just people. But that's, that's a kind of a weird story. Cause it's like, I was an imposter. And then I felt like by the end, it you gave battled me some it. confidence. Yeah, yeah. In a way. So I don't know. What about you, Liz? Do you have any stories about being an imposter you want to share? I think the only one is that, um, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about how I don't love production. I think I get very intimidated by the experience and I get in my head and I, I don't feel like I have all the answers um, when people ask me questions. But when we did pickups for Speed of Life, it was genuinely one of the most joyful days of my life. Like, uh, it was like a five person crew. We moved very fast. We got everything we needed. And I knew the answer to every question. And I think looking back on it, it's the intimidation factor of being on the set and the amount of people who are surrounding you and the amount of people that are listening to your answer. And then the like fallout, the waterfall of like one answer and like what that means to like 17 different departments, right? So you're gonna, or at least I am gonna overthink everything. Yeah, like just you were saying, it's like you have to get in the frame of mind of like being relaxed and confident and remembering that you have everything that you need, um, even if it feels like you don't. <laughs> um, but I think it's that formality, like, yeah, a celebrity comes in, you've seen their face a millions of times. You are thinking long term, like, what if I say something wrong? They'll remember it forever. You know, you're thinking of all these worries. Maybe that director fired even. Yeah, you know. being fired. All these their influence, their power is so massive. Regardless, I love your personal journey, Arik, because you were like, like the idea of unworthiness to realizing that you knew exactly what you were doing all along. Like that's yeah. really nice. And just having the confidence to to do the thing that you need to do to to deliver the right project. But yeah, I think without further ado, let's get to our conversation with Robin.
usually we talk about one specific production, but since you've worked on a thousand different shoots, we're just going to say your average commercial shoot for these. Um, so how many days do you typically shoot? One to two days. What are the budget ranges you deal with? Budget ranges can be from 10000 to $150,000. How long do you work on your projects from inception to being released? That can be anything from one day. Or, or my, my projects myself, or my projects, are those are long. Those are usually uh, two weeks to three months. Yeah, but I think it's interesting to say that, like, you do, like, get brought on things, like, last minute, and you do just work one day on them often, which often. is interesting. Often. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what is the typical population on set? How many people are you usually surrounded by? The shorter the shoot, the smaller the crew. So if it's a one day, it's usually just three people. Mm. If it's a two day, it could be up to 30 to 50 people. And if it's a week, it could be up to 50 to 100 people. Out of all your projects, how difficult was the last commercial you worked on? Mm. Uh, (laughs) Well, the last project I worked on was extremely difficult. Um, I was working with the NBA and I was flying all over the country uh, scanning NBA players, which sounds easy, but it actually was quite complicated. Scanning? What does that mean? Scanning for 2K games. Scanning their heads. So when you see those basketball players inside the game, that's actually their 3D physical likeness. And there's a a company that goes around and does that. Okay, okay. We have to just... I want to know more about this really quick. So (laughs) what's the process here? Like you just go to... uh, Do they come to the studio? Do you go to their house? Like how does the scanning happen? This is where it gets really tricky because they have to volunteer to be scanned. So think about it. NBA players, how are you going to get these guys? You can't get them on game day. You have to go to them. You have to be extremely um, close to where they're at. And it's got to be easy and fun for them, right? Those are all the things that need to happen. So we would um, find out uh, through, you you know, our connections with the NBA where the players were staying the night before. It had to be that they came in the night before, and then we would wait for them at that hotel. And I would be waiting in the lobby, and we have a truck, and a truck that has – 147 cameras all mounted uh, to scan these guys completely 3D. And that's, that's parked in the hotel lot. And so I, I have a list of the guys they want, and I'm working with the rep. And then we take each guy one at a time and put them in the truck. And, you know, normally we would get seven to eight players per team. Can you just self-define what you do for a living? <laughs> Like, clearly you do a lot. I just want to hear your definition of your profession. Well, I think if you were to just put one word, it would be a a fixer. One word would be a fixer. And that's like in England, that's a location scout, but I'm so much more. Uh, A client may call me and I can do everything from produce to location scout, nuts to bolts. And I'm a photographer. And so those are, that's kind of how I would, in the short version but I've done almost every job in the business, except um, I don't, I mean, I can edit, but it's not what I really do. So, But you would basically call yourself a producer in the larger sense, right? Like, because you can pretty much, like, if you had to, you could take a production from just an idea into a finished project. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's interesting, like, what producers end up doing, you know, from job to job, because it does vary a lot. And I think on budget, it definitely depends on what you end up doing. Can you talk to us about, like, I don't know, just like you've got hired as a producer and then, like, what, like, a different thing you had to do that you didn't think had to do anything with producing that you had to do to get the job done? Oh, there's so many things. I mean, it's so I'm working with a company here in San Francisco, Swordfish. Um, with Matt Silverman, and we fly in uh, into um, Buffalo, New York, in the middle of, of a, a hurricane, a huge storm. And um, I make the great decision to not have us drive from uh, Buffalo to the final destination, which is about two hours south in Corning, New York, and we hire a car. And we get there, and the the car that they've given us is not the four-wheel drive that sh- they should have given us because that's the owner took that home. They gave us the 10-foot limo. 
<laughs> what? In a snowstorm. I'm not kidding. So oh, when you talk God. about doing something that you weren't planned to do was risking my life, and Matt also, and we had gone too far, and we just didn't know how that snowstorm was going to affect us. So the weather's a big deal in producing. So did you end up driving the limo? Yes, we took the limo, <laughs> and um, <laughs> at some point... Uh, we were going 20 miles an hour, and the snow was coming down so bad, and the back of that limo was fishtailing, and there was nobody else on the road, nobody. Wow. And the limo driver was saying, I don't know if we're going to make it, and I don't know if I can turn around. And Matt and I were literally holding hands, gripping each other's hands, just silent in the back, just silent. And we made it in, and the limo driver had to stay the night. They have closed all the roads. But those are really unpredictable circumstances that uh, weather is a big one. You can plan for a lot of things. You can even plan for the weather, but sometimes it comes around and bites her really hard. So I think maybe we should jump back in time now just to kind of hear about how all this got started. So like, how did you find yourself um, on a film set working? What was the first thing that you ever did? So it's kind of a, a... a, a little bit, bit of a story here. I actually was working in a lumber mill in uh, Humboldt County, Arcata, uh, pulling wood and not going anywhere fast. I was going to school, but that wasn't going well, Humboldt State. And I didn't even know I wanted to be in television. And I happened to be working next to a brilliant man who helped me and guided me and mentored me and made me believe that I needed to do more than be in a mill. And eventually we came up with this idea of what about the media? And he told me how to do it. And I did exactly what he said. And three days later, I got a job in in television. Wait, what did he tell you? (laughs) What's the key? What did he say? Well, it's on my website, but I'll tell you here. You make three lists. It's it's really, um, it's like a key to a door, these three lists. And the first list is basically, who are you? And I don't mean like... You have to spend some time on this list. Do you do you like to have control of your environment or do you like adventure? Are you better in the mornings or are you better in the evenings? Who are you as a person? You have to kind of know yourself. And so we spent some time on that list. And the second list is what jobs pertain to those passions that you have that who are you? And it was very obvious right out of the get-go that I love people. I love stories. I love people. And so he's thought, well, the media would be good. We had a number of different things, counselor, you know, there's different things that he put up there. We just totally had no boundaries here. And the third list is what can you do tomorrow to break into that industry that you've picked? Tomorrow, this is the key. So I did exactly what he said. I went home, I got my resume together, and that next day, I called, this was before the internet, this is like 1978. So I called all around, and then I started walking around to the different radio stations, and I met a woman. And she liked me, and she knew there was a job opening over at KVIQ. So she called Sally Knowles over at KVIQ, and she sent me over there, and I got a job that afternoon. Now, that was wow. my break in. And it was, <laughs> it was the traffic department. And I worked that department for two years. And I made friends with everybody in that station. And I worked almost every job in that station except sales. So when you started this, like, what was your dream? Was it just to work in media, like very simple? Or did you have more of a like a clear goal when you were making these lists that uh, kind of led you to your first job? I had no goal. I was completely lost. Seriously. No goal. I, basically, what I wanted to do was have, I didn't, I wanted to have fun. I wanted adventure. I wanted a job that would take me places and travel. And I wanted to hear people's stories. And I wanted to meet a lot of people and touch a lot of different things. That's what I wanted. I didn't, I didn't want to just be, um, you know, I didn't want to produce a movie or anything. That wasn't even in my concept. I just basically wanted to meet a lot of people. How did you get from traffic to larger sets? So I worked my way through, I became a board operator. I started going to school again at the local community college and I learned the back end. So I learned how to read a scope. I learned of all the different mediums. I learned all of that stuff. And I got a job at the local PBS station for one year as a board operator. And that was my very first tech job. And then I came back to the station and worked as a board operator there. And, and then I got 
a really big break, I became a news photographer, news camera person in 1985. And there were no women news photographers ever. Oh, you never saw that. And so I did that for two years. And eventually I left the station and went to work for an ad agency for five years. And again, print, radio, and television. I, I, did, I was the person that, that produced all of those things. And yet still, when I came to Sacramento, I had to, I had to reinvent myself. And this is where the real career started because the market of Eureka, California is completely different from the market of Sacramento, California. You're, you're playing a much bigger market, which is completely different from the market of San Francisco, right? So you're jumping markets, jumping jobs. When I got to Sacramento, I became a PA. And that was really the beginning of learning how to work in a team and how to freelance and have uh, my own company. So even after all that experience working at the radio station and then at the, the PBS affiliate and then doing the ad stuff, you still had to start again as a PA when you got to Sacramento? Nobody knew me in Sacramento. Right, if I was in Eureka, I could have probably become a producer in Eureka, right? And then come down, but I didn't want to do that. Um, I'd already spent enough time in Eureka and I wanted to jump a market. I was producing in Eureka, but when you come to a bigger market, nobody knows you. And yeah, you could probably take your reel around and do this and do that, but immediately I could get in. Immediately. Within two days, I could be working as a PA. And again, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know who to go to for an editing. I didn't know who the good shooters were and who the good and who wasn't, right? I didn't know them as much as they didn't know me. And to produce, you really need to know what's around you at a deeper level. And so um, I went and I was interviewing with some production companies to come on staff. And Derek Packard from Double Vision said, you know, Robin, about 80% of the market here is freelance. Why don't you start PAing and see where it goes? And I did. It was the smartest thing I ever did because it really taught me how to produce in this market, which is, is different than Eureka. So then how long did you PA before you jumped to your next like position? And I mean, and did you go from PAing to producing or was it like PA, production coordinator, production supervisor, and then finally producing? So I got really lucky. I was PAing and, and as I was PAing, I was also working with some production houses on um, producing my own stuff. So I, I was kind of like mixing it up quite a bit, getting my name out there. In about three years, I PA'd. I PA'd sports. I had so many adventures. And my rate went up as I did that too. So like the more you PA, the better that gets. And after three years in Sacramento, uh, I got a call from a company called Spectrum Films. And they were shooting film in that day. And they were doing all these high-end commercials in Sacramento. And they needed a location scout. And would I be willing to come in and talk to them? And that was a huge break. And I became, a, and they taught me how to location scout and also how to produce, line produce commercials. So that's, that was a big break. I'm sorry, I'm still like wrapping my mind around this a little bit. Can you talk about the experience of being a PA, having all of this intelligence and experience and uh, backbone behind you? I mean, it's like you're not a babe in the woods. You, you know what you're doing and you're capable of probably running the shoot. How do you kind of convince yourself emotionally like to, to just follow orders? Is that a way? It was <laughs> hard. Kind of, yeah. It was really hard. I mean, as a PA, you're at the bottom of the ladder and I had been at the top of the ladder in Eureka. I mean, I was, you know, sought after. I, ad, ad agencies were coming to me and saying, coming on board, we, we, you have all these big clients. But when I came to Sacramento and I looked at that market, I knew that if I tried to do what I, what I was doing in Eureka, it wasn't going to work. And my reputation would suffer. And so you only have one or two tries at a market. If you mess up, especially in freelance, it can, it can really damage your reputation. So, yeah, I had to kind of bite it and come bring my ego down quite a bit. And it was hard. The first few jobs were really hard, but it really served me in the long run. Because as a PA, you learn almost every department, which I didn't know coming from Eureka. We didn't have those kinds of shoots. 
the shoots in Eureka were very small. They didn't have departments. I didn't know anything about all of these different jobs. So as a PA, I got to work for all of the different departments, which made me a much better producer. But the emotional, I'm much better than that other PA. Why aren't they picking me? I had moments, believe me. Moments. Oh, yes. Yeah. And being a woman, it was really hard because they would automatically, believe it or not, just go for the guy. Oh, yeah, let's bring in, you know, Joe. And be like, what? I have all of this experience. Well, I Joe work. could maybe carry more in their eyes. Is that well, the idea? Um, well, w what happened was we were doing the, remember that show 911? Do you remember that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, well, I was yes. doing 911 up in uh, <laughs> Shasta. Some uh, girl had been pushed off of a cliff and she fell 50 feet and her father was on the rescue team. So that was the story. And we oh, get, I thought you meant in real life. I was no. That's I, that's the story in real life. We were reenacting it. Nine one one was oh a reenactment. Oh my god! Then show. I really didn't know nine one one. Okay, yeah. please go. <laughs> nine one one's a reenactment show. Emergency nine one one, and we were reenacting her fall. So they brought up a, a stunt person from L.A. We built this this huge uh, contraption on the edge of a cliff, and then we were going to push her off. You know all this stuff. And the audio person broke their leg on the chute, broke oh their gosh. ankle because of how rough the conditions were. I had been running audio up in Eureka for years. Immediately, they picked some guy who had never run audio, and I was deeply offended. They knew I could run audio. It was just the way that works. You have to bite it at that time. You have to just say, okay, that's okay. I'm going to get through this. And it has nothing to do with me. And you get onto the next job and you just do the, the same thing. You just excel as best you can. But um, I think that experience made me a, a much more empathetic person to PAs. I'm always like, why do they have to stay? It's, they've been here 10, 12 hours already. If we're not using them. Well, we might. Well, then let's, let, let, let's keep one. And let the other five go if we're not going to use them, okay? Because <laughs> right. they have to come back here tomorrow, and they're here first, by the way. So I'm, I'm, I'm very empathetic towards PAs. When you ch change markets to Sacramento, um, how old were you? Were you like in your like late 20s, early 30s? I moved to Sacramento in 1990. I turned 30. So I and became so a PA at 30. What was the age range of the PAs that I you were working with? I would say 21 to 35. Oh, okay. I mean, I know that when I hire here in the Bay Area, I still get a range, but it's probably a little younger range because they move up quicker. So the market really does determine a lot. Do you think they move up quicker just because of the, the way things are now? Or do you think it's just because the different markets? Like, do you think in Sacramento, it's still the same? Like, oh, you know, PAs are in that age range or are PAs just younger these days than they were in the 90s? I don't know. How about that? That, that's a good I, my thought process is that it's all about um, how jobs open up right you want to you don't want to stay a PA right you don't you know some people uh, uh, get out in three months and for me it took three years before that opportunity came up and that is because I was in a smaller mid market where opportunities just don't come up that much when you're in a bigger market you have more opportunities to move faster so well, as far as like the age range, I'd have to look at the Sacramento market. And I know the Sacramento market right now is really putting a lot into bringing their film. They got a new film commissioner. They see the, the benefits of having movies shot in Sacramento. And so uh, they have incentives. There's a vibrant film community there. So my guess is there are going to be more PAs that are trying to move up. When I started as a PA, which was like probably um, 2008, 2009, around there, I noticed that there were some PAs who were on the older side, you know, like maybe mid 30s or even older, you know, and some of those folks are still doing it, I think, or maybe they've transitioned out. But I mean, I'm just want to kind of get at this whole like kind of career PA thing that can happen sometimes. And I just wanted to sort of get your take on that. Like, is that something that you think is a danger to someone who's starting as a PA that you can just get locked into those positions? I think it's a very individualistic thing. I know some people that have been PAs their entire life and they fit perfectly into that and they're very happy there. There are not very many of them, but they're there. And then there are people who just can't get forward because they have a bad attitude or because they're not consistent, because they don't show up early. They don't really know the nuances 
of a set. They don't fit well into a crew. They cause dissension. They're not asked back unless nobody else is available. And then some of the ones that I knew were like the best. <laughs> you know, they yeah. were just so good. And it's like, well, you know, they, they just keep on doing it. And then there were a couple that I got worked with who just, you know, I would want to call as a PA, but I just can't anymore because they're now, you know, assistant directors or, you know, production managers or whatever. Right. So how do you how do you make that next level jump, right? Right. That's the question. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I created the, this course that I created is because it is very – it's not easy to make the jump, but if you do the right things, it becomes way easier. The film community is looking for good PAs, and they're looking for good PAs to mentor into their – places because they know that's how they're going to keep a very vibrant film community working you know they don't want to shut the door but they don't want people that don't get it that don't understand what making a film is about and so nuance on a film set is 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 huge and i think a lot of times people that don't have that information and they come on and they get a bad rep right out of the gate they don't make it to the next level then you have people that maybe can get to that level, but they don't know how to move into the next position, how to become an assistant director. Let's look at Hilton Day. Oh, gosh, yeah, I love Hilton. Right. <laughs> Hilton, so he's, a, he's in my course. Oh, and is he? he? Oh, wow. Yeah, he, gave a, he, he, he gave a lot of great information about he's an AD now. He didn't, he didn't want to be an AD. He came onto a set as a PA, he tells his story of his first day as a PA and how he he fought to get to the set on time. He had all this traffic. It was horrible. He finally got to the set. He's three minutes late. And his AD says, you're late. And he's like, well, I'm on time. Look, look. He's like, you're, you're, you're late. You're 15 minutes late. That's how he got on a set, right? And immediately right. within the first, I don't know, day of being on a set, he knew he didn't want to be an editor anymore. And he changed and he became an AD. He had to PA, but he knew at that point what he wanted to do, so he just cozied up to all the ADs he could find. He did a really good job for them, and they mentored him. Yeah, Hilton. Hilton's a really interesting story because like, he's one of the most hardworking people that I know in the world. Just really, really busts his ass. And he PA'd for quite a long time, but he was able to get on like the biggest movies that came into town. So he's like worked on some of the biggest things, and... I mean, I don't know how he pulled it off, but he's just always getting on those sets that, that not everyone could get on, you know, necessarily. And then, you know, a few opportunities, and now he's, like, pretty much a full-time AD. I think now he is a full-time AD. He is a full-time AD. Yeah, he, yeah. That's all he does. He, I think he did it um, by connecting. In this business, it's really all about connections. I have traveled nationally and internationally through my connections. I, I just dumped all of my photos from Aperture, thank you, Apple, to Lightroom. So I've been going through my last five years in photos. And if you look at my photo library, the diary of it is unbelievable. I'm on the border in, and I'm embedded with the border police. I'm in Portugal at a stadium with some of the top soccer players in the world. I'm uh, embedded with the sheriff in Salisbury, Maryland, doing heroin busts. I'm meeting NBA players. To get to that level, you have to have an, a good ability to connect with people. And that's what Hilton has. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, I've only been a PA like one or two days total in my life. And I think a lot of that is the fear of trespassing over these invisible barriers on a film set and not knowing what those are. How, um, and it sounds like you're doing a lot right now in educating people about that. What are things that a beginning PA should never do and <laughs> wouldn't know not to do? <laughs> There's so many, right? Well, the first thing, of course, is the set is a sacred ground. And to understand that on a really deep level, when you come on to a film shoot, you're going to have a number of different places. You're going to have a place where they all gather and they watch what's happening on the set, Video Village. You're going to have craft services, which is where people eat. You're going to have different areas, but the set itself is sacred ground. So what you don't want to do is bring a drink in there or possibly move something on the set or be on the set at all without permission. The set is, is not something to be taken lightly. 
And the other thing I would say is watch your mouth. You know, it looks like it's a summer camp. Everybody's laughing and talking. When you see film crew come together, it's it's a kind of a wonderful thing to watch. If 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 it's a good film crew, they all kind of they'll start unpacking the trucks and there'll be laughing going on and joking and you'll see the director and the DP and the AD probably meeting in different times and everybody kind of knows their their role. And so as a PA, you want to just be careful about what you say. You don't want to cause any dissension. You want to find out where you need to be and just watch and listen. And you'll learn a lot. I think that's the, the one of the keys is not to come on a set thinking that you know what's going on because you just don't. Like, are there different things that you'd want to keep in mind depending on if you're like in the AD department or the production department? Absolutely. I mean, if you're... If you're um, in the production department, they're going to have different needs than somebody if you're like working with the locations department or working with talent. This is part of the part of the hard part of being a PA is you could be stuck anywhere and you have to adjust to where you are. You could be put anywhere on that shoot and you adjust to that place. So for instance, let's say locations wants you to go post a bunch of signs. You need to kind of have that ability to do that. So you have to get in your car, run the errand, go get the stuff. They may not have the stuff. They may have the stuff. You don't, you're right. This is, these are all the problems with this particular job. Where maybe as in the production department, they're just asking you to help create a call sheet. So you need to understand uh, whatever program they're using and how to type that in. And they won't make it too difficult because you're a PA. They won't ask you to actually create the call sheet from nothing because you're just the PA, but they'll ask you to help with it. So whatever department you find yourself in, and it can be, you know, talent to getting rid of the garbage, you just need to really um, do the best job you can with the best attitude. And eventually, somebody will notice that. They will. Is there anything specific that caught your attention that you saw someone go the extra mile and, and stuck in your head and then help inspired you to help that person you know, go up the career ladder? There's a couple of PAs that I thought were really phenomenal. One was Gen- Genevieve McCarthy. She worked with me on the Apple job. We, oh, yeah. through Phoenix Editorial, produced all of the iPhone localizations. So when the iPhone came out in 2006, nobody knew how to use it in the world. And so Apple hired us to, to for a year and a half to create all of these iPhone tutorials in French, German, Russian, and it was a brutal job. Um, It was 10 and a half hours a day with an hour drive on each end, and the stress was really intense. One day, the producer and the director came to the set, and somebody had spilled a white can of paint on the road, and they drove through it, and they got white paint all underneath their cars. And they came to the set, and they took Genevieve without my permission and they said go fix our cars we need this done and so she she found another PA and they drove the cars to the car wash and the car wash guy laughed at him and said that's paint is dried you have to go get this done professionally it's going to cost you this much money and when she brought that news back to the producer who was not a really nice person the producer got mad at her and yelled (laughs) at her oh man now, I didn't know any of this was happening, and um, Genevieve handled it because I, I was um, very busy with some other things. She handled it, and she got it taken care of, and she didn't make a big deal about that producer acting terrible towards her. That I ge- could never do this. I'm just hearing this story. It, you know, here's the deal. horrible. Here's the deal. If you get through this, it's kind of like tempering you. Because when you become in the business, you're going to run into things that you weren't expecting. And it's not about you. It's about the shoot. And if you can understand that at a really deep level, you will do well in this business. But what about all of the people who behave uh, abhorrently in this industry? They don't come back. Eventually, that producer got fired. The system works it out. It, it works does. them out. It yeah. does. And and she got fired because eventually I, I caused such a big stink at her bad behavior. We had a huge meeting. It was terrible. But that's what happens. And you don't ask them back. And that's how it kind of filters to you get these really great crews that work together that love each other. Because they filter up, right? They're tempered. And they understand. 
and the ones that don't get it fall off. And that's what my course is trying to teach is that the, there is a way to approach this, that you can have an incredible career. But a lot of people, there, there's nothing really out there right now for these guys. There is a class that they can take in New York to be a set PA that you have to go to New York for two days. And there's a class in L.A. to be a movie PA that you go to for two days. And I would encourage that as well. I mean, why not? But you have to go there and pay all that money. And they're only going to teach you their, what they teach you in those two days. As a PA and going in that career path, like what jobs does that lead to? Like, do you feel like as a PA, you can start as a PA and kind of become anything? You can do any job on the set starting as a PA. You could be the director eventually. What a PA does is it, it opens the door for you to get into the business and connect up with the people in the business, basically up to you. So I know there are a number of directors that started as a PA. You know, right. it, 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 it doesn't limit you. It actually lets you float from department to department and lets you understand what each department is about and where you fit best. That's the best part about being a PA. Just like Hilton, he thought he wanted to be an editor. Being an editor and being an AD are completely different jobs, <laughs> right, man. Right. Like, and now he's super happy. Would he have been a happy editor? Probably, but is he ecstatic now? He travels all over the country, works on these fantastic projects. He would have never known that if he hadn't have been a PA. It's not something that you can just, that just happens though. And I think that's something that, you know, I mean, I, this is my experience at least, is that you, you can't just, you don't just start as a PA and then like you can end up, you know, working in camera department or working in art department. It's like you have to do that yourself. It really is on you to control your own destiny. Absolutely. I have a, a little saying, direct your destiny. Because that's what you're doing when you do this. You are actually starting to ride the horse. You have the reins in your hand and you're telling the horse where to go. And so what does that mean? It means you're empowering yourself to make decisions about where you want to be in life. And that means you don't wait for other people to, to bring you on. You assertively go out and look and see what you like and what you don't like. Who you, who you want to work with and who you don't want to work with. And you, you produce your life. So, yeah, when you come on a set as a PA and you start working, nobody is going to come up to you and say, hey, want to come into the camera department? How hey, you like this? They're not even going to talk to you. But if you go up and you know those lenses or you go up to the craft services and you're so ahead of the game with Crafty and you know that she's going to need the or he's going to need the, the drinks put out and that they're going to need help with the garbage at the end of the day and the producer sees that the production department is going to be looking at you, whatever you do on a set, they're watching you. They're watching to see where you best fit in. Or even if you do fit in eventually between the two things, them watching you and you really being interested in where you want to be, or even trying to find out where you want to be. It's like art, really. It's like art. You are, are, are being an artist on your own life. And they're helping you do that. You can do anything. I wanted this life that I got. I did, Ulrich. I didn't want to be on a movie set for six months. I didn't, I didn't want to be with a crew for more than a week. <laughs> I wanted so many experiences. And I could, go, I could talk to you for days about the things that, that the, the unbelievable shoots I've been on. I mean, the stories I've heard have been incredulous. And I started as a PA. After, you know, working at a smaller market, you, you, have to, you have to put your ego aside and you have to understand that it's about the team and it's about the work, whatever that work is. Yeah, I mean, I should state for the record that I did start as a PA <laughs> too. So you know, and I and I've kind of ended up in my own my own zone from there, you know. And it wasn't always like it, it's not necessarily like a whatever a clear path. It's kind of a windy road, you know. Like you end up where you end up through lots of different twists and turns. But uh, but yeah, I yeah, and I I really value my time as a PA. But I know a lot of people who don't don't either didn't have interest in doing it or just never did. And um, I do think it's important to like, kind of get a sense of what a set's like, you know, I'm too selfish. Anyway. 
Um, (laughs) So, Robin, taking a step back, um, you've produced this life of adventure for yourself. Why are you giving back and creating this course and trying to help and guide all these um, newer filmmakers and newer production assistants in their careers? Well, um, in 2015, I won won the COLA Award, which is the California On Location Award. It's a big award here in California. And I went down to Santa Monica and I was up against all those big location managers down in LA and I won. And when that happened, it gave me an opportunity because then at that point I became an expert in my field. And so I thought, well, gosh, it would be great to give back to some location scouts. I was going to do a location scout course. And I started to write that course and I realized that's not where my heart was. <laughs> my heart was with the PAs. <laughs> I'm like, man. So I don't think I even got like two lessons done on the on the locations. And I just dove into PA and it just came out like butter, man. It was just like, and I wrote for a couple of years. I wrote 78 lessons. And I just, um, I had them vetted. Um, 78 oh my 78, gosh 78 videos I produced in this some of uh, four of them I use on the website and the rest are all in the course and I I just really feel strongly that um somebody took me I was working in the lumber mill I was going nowhere fast I was I was I was gonna not have a life that I wanted and somebody really really turned me around and if I could give that back that's a gift for me, really. And so I created this course, and it wasn't easy. Um, it was a really hard thing to do. It, it's expensive to create a course like this. And I had a lot of help, Freeman Productions and Matt Silverman from Swordfish, um, Digital Core, Brent, Kirsten. Those people really helped me. Um, and then and it's a great course. It'll really make a difference for some people. That's why I did it. I just, I just had this feeling that they needed it more than anybody else. And that doesn't mean down the line, I won't do a location course or, you know, what's it like to be in the art department and all of that kind of stuff. But I think that what makes this course really different is not just me telling people, I went out and did all these interviews with directors and producers and location scouts and craft services and other produ- and other production assistants. And those are peppered out throughout the entire, there's over like 300 uh, sound bites in the whole course. Wow. So here's a question I have for you, and it's kind of tough to answer, I think, given the times with the pandemic and everything. But do you think that a, a freelance life of uh, PAing, like going to whatever department you want to as a freelancer is still viable? Or do you feel like you know, that that's sort of going away. Oh, I think it'll be more viable than ever. I think what's going to happen is, and I, we're already seeing it, I'm already getting calls for work, because everybody is now separated and we can't be together, the internet becomes incredibly important and video becomes important. It's because our stories is how we connect. And I think you're going to see the travel industry really hurt. You're going to see... Um, restaurants and the food industry really hurt, but I, the entertainment industry is going to explode. And I think PAs will actually work more because you'll have um, the set will be less populated with producers and directors, and they're going to need more hands on site to do those things that they can't do when they're on site. They'll zoom them in, you know what I mean? Oh, I see. Interesting. I think I think the, you're going to see an explosion in the entertainment market. I really do. I think they'll still do movies. Um, I was just talking to Debbie Brubaker, and she was telling me that the way, oh, the way that I know her, she's in my course. <laughs> uh, Debbie's great. Debbie's great. Debbie vetted the course. She Aww. worked with me. She was my consultant. She tells me the way the movies are going to do it is they're going to quarantine the whole crew for two weeks in a hotel, and then they all shoot together. And then they break up. Here's the thing about our business that I think is really wonderful and spectacular is we don't have a business of, no, we can't do that. It just doesn't exist in our world. (laughs) Right. I mean, we just don't. We don't have that in any way, shape, or form from the top to the bottom. It's really how much money and how much time do you have. 
Right. That's it. We'll figure it out we'll one way or another. Out. And that's <laughs> that is the core of our of our industry. So no, I I firmly believe, and quite quickly actually, um, that our business will explode, and people will be working. Where I think we have bigger problems is with you know AV five and stuff like that in California. But that shouldn't really affect PAs because they'll just payroll them. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other discussion for another time. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but thanks so much, Robin. I think we're down to our final five questions. Um, you ready? More rapid fire? Absolutely. All right. So this is usually about um, like a f- movie making or a filmmaker question, but I think this is going to work for production too. So what's the first project you ever worked on? And how do you feel about that project now? Wow. The first project I ever worked on as a freelancer was at the horse races in Sacramento, California, where I had to climb into a 30-foot tower in 108-degree heat and film the horse races for five hours at a time with no bathroom break. Oh, my God. I don't think I could get up that ladder now. (laughs) How about that? It literally was a ladder. You had a little camera with a... With a pack on your back. Oh, my goodness. That was my first job. What's the best filmmaking or production advice you've received? Boy, that's a tough one. Oh, my gosh. Uh, watch your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a mouth. I don't know what to say. I have to really be careful because I'm super opinionated. It's difficult. And so I've had to learn to put a lid on it a lot of times and just shut up. I think it's the first time anyone's ever said that on the show. <laughs> it's great. Um, <laughs> do you have a goal as a producer? My goal is always to do the best job I can for the client, no matter what. Um, if you could go back in time, what's the piece of advice you'd give yourself? Watch your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, no, seriously. A piece of advice I could give myself, I just wrote this course. I wrote this course for myself 30 years ago. I did. If I'd have had this course, I'd have been out of that in three months. Seriously. It's so hard to be a PA. It's so hard to get into the business and get in and break that door down because there's nothing out there that tells anybody how to do it. And it's nuances. And that's the thing. It's not one thing. It's so many things, right? So I would say if I had to boil it down to one thing, it's learn how to work with a team. And then last question, is making movies slash commercials slash videos hard? Definitely. It's hard emotionally. It's hard physically. It's, it's, a, it's hard intellectually. It's hard as an artist. You're going to come up on things that you just had no idea was going to happen. And sometimes those things make it better. And you have to be open for that. And that's even harder. Awesome. So where should people go, Robin, if they want to learn more about you or your company and and your course? So I have two websites they can go to. If they want to know about me, it's just my name, robinkincaid.com. And if they want to go to my course, it's kincaidproductions.com. And they're all linked together. So you could go to one and just find the other. Thanks, Robin. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And um, this has just been really great. I think it's so important for people to hear uh, these, these these stories about being a PA and really what it takes to get started because anyone can do it. You just have to, you know, I think stick with it and, you know, just know what not to do. Basically, (laughs) Once you're in the mix and once you start it and the road becomes apparent and becomes in front of you, you follow that road with the most best of intentions and your life will unfold in front of you. Well, that's a good place to end. Absolutely. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you for listening. Thanks to Robin Kincaid for being on the show. Check out our website, makingmoviesishard.com, where you can find links to the things we talked about on this episode. And if you want to get in contact with us, send an email to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at MMIH Podcast. I am at Liz Manishal on Twitter and at Liz Manishal Film on Instagram. And Ulrich, what are you? I am Ulrich B on Twitter and Instagram. And um, if you friend me on Facebook, I will be your friend. Because I don't have nearly 5,000 friends. So, you know, join us in our community of Facebook peoples. Whatever. (laughs) Also, if you like the show, tell a friend. Help us get the word out. Leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever you listen. Last but certainly not least, thanks to our producers, Greg Holtzman, Joshua Sterling Bragg, editor Allison Stoney, and the whole Bloodstream Media team for making this episode possible. And we will talk to all of y'all next week.
every friend is a stranger that you've met. No, that's not an expression. No. It's something like that. I think I, I know what you're talking about, though. You're totally so right. He is like, you know, he was a, a stranger. Hold on, Sean's in the bedroom. We're doing video now, Sean. Hi, Sean. <laughs> That's a, bonus, that's a bonus uh, cameo for all you <laughs> YouTube listener watchers yeah. out there. Um, I'll just wait till he gets, did he poop in his outfit? <laughs> 